Good evening, everyone. How are you? Um, thank you for coming along tonight. Um, tonight, I'm going to be uh, presenting this talk, Clean Architecture in .NET MAUI and ASP.NET Core. Uh, the core subject of tonight's talk is going to be, as Adam said earlier in the tech news, about code sharing in .NET. So I'm going to talk all about sharing code across your full solution, your full code base in .NET, um, using uh, ASP.NET Core, .NET MAUI, and a little bit of Blazor as well. Um, So uh, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an introduction. And uh, I'm going to talk about what do we mean when we say full stack. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what do we mean when we say shared code. Now, I'm using clean architecture here to, to really demonstrate this principle of sharing code across your full stack. Um, so I'm going to ask the question, what is clean architecture? And then we're going to look at clean architecture with .NET MAUI. And uh, we're going to look at the traps to avoid when sharing code across your full stack. So I'm going to introduce myself. Um, my name is Matt Goldman. I'm a solution architect here at SSW. This is what I used to look like before the pandemic. <laughs> um, so a little bit about me. I'm a full stack web and mobile developer here at SSW. Uh, I am the author of the book .NET MAUI in Action. It's not out yet. Um, it will be out early next year. Uh, and in fact, uh, I've got coupon codes to give away for two electronic copies of this book which I'll be giving away later today. Um, uh, uh, hopefully, Adam Kogan will come up here later on, and he'll pick the two best questions asked in the Q&A at the end. Um, if not, I'll do it. Um, but the, the best questions asked will get free copies of this book. So uh, if you're interested, you know, find me some questions later on. Um, some interesting things about me. I am into motorcycles. A uh, bit of a tendency for people here at SSW. A few of us uh, like motorcycles. Uh, I am a home brewer. I really enjoy home brewing. And uh, interesting factoid about me is my degree is in science fiction. Um, so I will happily take questions on that at the end as well. Um, OK, so uh, we have an app that I want to tell you guys about here. It's called uh, SSW Rewards. And um, uh, it's actually not made in .NET MAUI. It's made in uh, Xamarin, Xamarin Forms. We are in the process of upgrading it to .NET MAUI. But anyway, if you scan this code, uh, this QR code, um, that will take you to the App Store or the Google Play Store, and you can install this app. Um, or you can just search SSW Rewards on the Google Play Store or the uh, iOS App Store. And uh, if you uh, install this app, you can win some cool prizes that you can see here on the screen. Um, and I'm going to give you a code at the end of this talk, a QR code that you can scan, and that's going to give you 500 points that you can put towards winning these cool prizes. So um, yeah, hopefully you've installed that. And if not, um, as I said, you know you can just search for it uh, on the App Store, and you'll be able to get that app. So first question, what is full stack? Well, when we're talking about, about full stack, we're normally talking about a database. We start with a database. Uh, and then we have some kind of server or API. And then we have usually a web UI. Nowadays, of course, we're talking about a mobile and desktop UI as well. So you can build the different parts of these stack in different technologies. So for, uh, this, is, you know, this is what makes up your stack. So for the database, you could use Postgres. Um, you could use Cosmos. You could use Azure SQL. You could use MySQL. You could use MongoDB. Oh, so many. Um, for your API, you could use ASP.NET Core. You could use Node.js. You could use PHP if you want to. Like Adam uh, said earlier, you can do that in Visual Studio now. Uh, you could use Ruby. You could, uh, you know, uh, use Angular for your web UI. You could uh, use any one of the JavaScript frameworks that came out in the last 15 minutes. Uh, you could, you know, you could write your UI in Flutter now if you're doing mobile. Um, you know, you could, uh, you could use FML. That's a Facebook markup language. Uh, okay, React if you insist. Um, well, I, I don't know about you guys, but th this is starting to look like the back of a developer's laptop. Okay, that's a lot of stickers. Wouldn't it be great if .NET could come along and just wave a magic wand and make all that go away? Well, it can. It can. So why don't we have a look? So um, the first thing that I want to talk about on this story is, is this journey to the, the unified .NET. Now, this slide came out a couple of years ago now. This is .NET 5. .NET 7 just re released last week. But I'm using this slide because it really um, this was really when they went all in with this, this message. We're going to go to, to one .NET. Um, and you know you're going to be able to build desktop, web, cloud, mobile, you know games, 
AI, everything just in .NET. Now, as I said, that was .NET 5. We've gone a long way since then. Um, and in particular, the big thing is uh, Blazor. So since Blazor came along, uh, we can write we can write actually single page applications in the browser that run in the browser using Blazor. That's really cool. That really lets you uh, take that next step to making your full stack run with .NET. Um, but now the new kid on the block, of course, is .NET Maui. Uh, yep, believe it or not, that is actually the .NET Maui logo. Um, bit of a problem there, but yeah, not much we can do about that right now. Um, but .NET Maui lets you build. Um, lets you build mobile and desktop applications in .NET as well. So with ASP.NET Core, uh, Entity Framework for your database, ASP.NET Core for your uh, uh, your API, Blazor for your web app, Maui for your iOS, Android, Windows, or Mac OS app, you can literally write a full stack application with .NET that runs everywhere. Um, well, what do we mean by code sharing? Okay, so because you've got a .NET full stack app, you know, you can share code. Well, well, what does that mean? Well, more importantly, what's the point? Who cares, right? So the main principle that drives the desire to share code across the stack is dry. Don't repeat yourself. You don't want to have to write the same code more than once in more than one place. Now, the dry principle, there's this quote here which states this principle, and it says, every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. So dry actually means something specific, and we're going to come back to this later on. But what I really want to talk about is code sharing, right? Uh, let's have a quick look at a quick demo. So let me go to here, and I'm going to create a new project. This is Visual Studio, and uh, I am going to create a, a Blazor app. In fact, I'm going to do Blazor WebAssembly, not Blazor Server. Uh, and uh, that's fine there. I am. That's all fine. That doesn't matter. The main things that I want to show you here are, uh, I'm going to tick this box here that says ASP.NET Core Hosted. What that means is that's going to give me an API backend that is not only going to, going to run and give us an API, but it's also going to serve out the static files that will let us run that Blazor WASM single page application in our web browser. So let's go ahead and create this and we'll see what the, uh, we'll see what the template gives us. Quick question, who here is already using Blazor? Yeah, cool, it's good. I, I, we're big fans of Blazor here at SSW. Um, we have got a bunch of internal uh, projects that we've done with Blazor, and we've got a, a lot of client projects that we've done with Blazor as well. And as you can see, um, what Blazor does is, uh, in fact, let's just take a quick look at this solution here, okay? So what we've got is uh, we've got the client application, uh, we've got the server application, and we've got this shared project here, okay? Now what the shared project does at this point is really just for demonstration. It's got this weather forecast type, uh, and if we look at the dependencies for the server, we can see that the server depends on that shared project, and we can see that the client, the Blazor client, also depends on that shared project. What that means is that if we look at the controllers here, and we look at this weather forecast controller, remember this is in the server project, we can see that um, the server project, and I'll just zoom in a bit there, uses that weather forecast type, which, as we can see, uh, is in the shared project. And the, um, let me just go to this fetch data page here, in the, the Blazor client application also uses that same weather forecast type, which is in the same place. So we don't have to duplicate that code. We don't have to repeat it anywhere. We don't have to repeat ourselves, right? We can use the same code across the so this is really very simple. This is coming out of the box template, but you're already starting to get a feel for what you can do sharing code with .NET nowadays. Now, I'm not going to run this because I, uh, you know, it's just the template. And I don't need to do that. But I am going to show you a magic trick. Before I show you this magic trick, um, quick question: Who here has used Xamarin before? Xamarin Forms. Okay. So I'm going to show you a magic trick, which something that you can do with .NET MAUI that you couldn't do with Xamarin Forms, which is really cool in my opinion. I can right click this solution and I can go add new project and I can add a .NET MAUI app to this same solution. Um, for people that don't know and people that haven't done Xamarin, um, may not seem like a big deal, but you couldn't do this with Xamarin. You couldn't add a Xamarin Forms application to an existing solution. If you wanted this kind of architecture where you had your Xamarin app and you had your web app and you had your API, you had to start with the Xamarin app first 
and then you would start adding the other projects. Of course, you can edit your solution file and do other things, but, but this, this is a real improvement. And of course, the other improvement here is that this .NET MAUI project is one project, whereas as Amman forms, you'd have the shared project, and then you'd have platform-specific projects as well. But just to tie off this demo here, I want to show you is, of course, that I can go add project reference, shared, OK. And now my MAUI app has access to that weather forecast type as well. And now what I've got here is a full stack .NET application with uh, a Blazor web app, an ASP.NET Core API server, uh, a shared project with some types in it, a class library, uh, and a mobile and desktop app. All of these are sharing that code. So I think that's really cool. So let's just uh, go back to our presentation. We don't need that anymore. OK, so we saw a quick demo. So we understand now what we mean by full stack. We understand what we mean by uh, uh, sharing code. What is clean architecture? And more importantly, why, why do we care? And why am I bringing this up? Well, in the example that we just saw, that shared project had a type in it, right? And that type was called weather forecast. That was used by our API, but it's also used by our, our web app, our, our Blazor app. It's also used by our .NET MAUI app. Now, technically, that's a domain model, and we're now exposing that in our UI. We're putting that out in the web. That's not really the best way to do things. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about clean architecture. Um, so what do we mean when we say clean architecture? So at SSW, we use clean architecture as it provides us the simplest approach to enterprise app development in .NET. Um, and by levering this, leveraging this approach, we can deliver applications that are um, uh, independent of frameworks, testable, independent of UI, independent of database, and independent of anything external. And this is the difference. This approach lets you build adaptable, maintainable code uh, which gives you the difference between an application that will last for three years and an application that, that can last for 20 years. Um, now, if what I just said sounds familiar, it's kind of a, uh, 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 a, a really passion subject for Jason Taylor here at SSW. Uh, he's the expert on this, and I'm going to show you some of his resources later on. And, and so if you've heard that message before, um, if you haven't heard that message before, it's because you haven't come to one of his talks or one of his hands-on workshops, and I really suggest you do. So what is the actual architecture? Well, in the middle, you have uh, your, if you think of it like uh, uh, in this model we, we see here, you, you start with your domain, and your domain is in the core. Uh, your domain project contains uh, enterprise logic and types. What do we mean by enterprise logic and types? Well, we mean uh, types that represent uh, part of the domain model for your whole business, not for this specific application, and logic that represents that as well. So you should be able to share this domain project across your enterprise. Then we have the application layer. The application layer contains business logic and types. Um, now, business logic and types is logic and types that are specific to this application. And uh, outside of that, in the outer layer, um, sorry, I should specify that application and domain together represent core. Um, and outside of this, you have the presentation layer and the infrastructure layer. The presentation layer, and bearing in mind this is a conceptual model, the presentation layer contains your UI projects. It contains uh, anything to do with communicating from core to the outside world. So it would contain your APIs as well. Infrastructure contains uh, infrastructure concerns like your database, anything to do with messaging, encryption, all that sort of stuff. Now, the most important thing about this architecture is all the dependencies point inwards. So the domain layer has no external dependencies. Application depends only on domain. Presentation depends on application. Infrastructure depends on application. And that gives us. This, uh, these benefits here that makes it independent of anything external. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that if you think back to the Blazor sample that we saw earlier, it doesn't really fit into this because you know weather forecast would be in domain and you know domain would then be exposed externally and you know we've then got things depending on each other. It, it just it's it's actually I don't want to knock it because that that template and that solution that you get using that template is awesome, right? It is awesome. But it's going to take a lot of refactoring as you progress and as your application grows in scope and complexity. Using this architecture lets you, you grow with your application. It's quite cool. So um, if you want to learn more about clean architecture, we have a rule on the SSW rules website 
there's a URL there that you can get to. It's ssw.com.au slash rules slash the main principles of clean architecture. That just covers those points that we just raised. Uh, and there's a QR code there as well with that URL encoded as a QR code. So you can scan that <clears throat> to learn a bit more about clean architecture as well. Okay, so um, I mentioned Jason Taylor. Uh, so Jason Taylor is a, a clean architecture expert here at SSW, globally recognized. Um, he talks about clean architecture uh, frequently here as well as at conferences all over the world. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of, of his clean architecture approach. Uh, you can follow that link that I sent. Um, but I am going to talk about his template. So when I said earlier that S SSW, we use uh, clean architecture to build our ap applications, we actually use his template, which lets us very quickly spin up a new clean architecture project. So I want to have a quick look at that template. So it's over here on GitHub. Um, and I'll give you a link to this at the end as well. But it's, uh, you know, github.com slash Jason Taylor dev slash clean architecture. If you look at the readme here, uh, there's a link here to a video of him giving a talk on clean architecture. And you can read about it a bit more here as well. Really, really cool. Uh, and it's, it's going to be really useful for us in terms of sharing code uh, and in terms of building maintainable, adaptable, long lived applications. Let's have a quick look at the code. So if we have a look at the source folder, we can see that we've got four projects that represent those layers that I mentioned. So domain is at the core. And in here, we have effectively some entities. So the clean architecture template out of the box is a, is a to-do app. Um, then we've got application. And application, we have effectively commands and queries. Uh, we've got some, some I would say, cross-cutting concerns. But some, so in this common folder, there are some uh, components of this application project that are relevant to the whole application project. Um, and then we've got uh, the use cases, so to-do items and to-do lists. And if we look in here, we've got our commands and queries, so it's all using CQRS. Uh, and in here, we've got some, uh, if I look at these two specific queries here, export to-dos and get to-dos, we've got uh, the query itself. Um, again, I'm not going to go too much into the code here. Uh, and we've got these DTOs. Um, so these DTOs are used in fact, I'll just point out something else as well. If I look at one of these DTOs here, you can see that they inherit from this IMAP from interface. Um, now, the IMAP from interface is uh, an interface that Jason has built into this template that uh, basically lets automatically wires up an auto, matter, auto mapper mapping profile. So you can see here that this um, to do list DTO automatically maps from this to do list entity. So, of course, that means that this application project has a dependency on the domain project because that's where the to-do list entity lives. In infrastructure, we have uh, some identity concerns, some services, but most importantly, the persistence layer. Uh, so we've got the DB context using entity framework core. And you can see that in here, we also depend on those domain types. So infrastructure also depends on domain. Uh, then we've got web UI, and web UI lives in our presentation layer. Now in here, we have, uh, in this version of this template, there is a client app built with Angular, which we're not concerned about because we want a Blazor client app. Um, but what I will show you in here is that uh, if you look in this source folder here, and you look in uh, app folder, uh, we will see that we have this web API client.ts. This is an automatically generated TypeScript client uh, that is a, um, uh, a TypeScript client that can be used by the Anglia application that includes those, DTI type, those DTO types transposed to TypeScript. Uh, and it includes some clients for automatically interacting with the API. Outside of the client app in the web UI project, we also have our controllers. So these are ASP.NET Core API controllers. There's a base controller here, which wires up some mediator pipelines for us. So all of these uh, controllers use mediator to execute the commands and queries. And those commands and queries return those DTO types. Um, these, this particular uh, controller here is using uh, just commands. But if I look at this one here, and just this example here, you can see that uh, 
the first the first method, the first action in this controller is returning a paginated list of these to-do item brief DTO types. So this also has a, a dependency on the application project, which is where those, those types live. So that, in a nutshell, is a, a whistle-stop tour of the clean architecture template. As I said, I'm not going to go into that too much now. Um, we'll come back to that shortly. Um, so we've had a look at the clean architecture template. We've already seen how in a full stack solution in .NET, we're sharing code across the stack, but not with the UI, OK? So the web API is using it. Uh, the infrastructure is using it. The application layer is using it. And they're all coming from the domain. They're all sharing code. The way that the, uh, the, way that the web app, the Angular app, is sharing code is by having code automatically generated for it by NSWAG, which is, is the, the code generator with the using that's creating that client. So we've had a look at Jason's template. Now, I'm going to show you something a little bit different. I'm going to show you how I've modified that template to work with .NET across the full stack. Now, Jason doesn't like this. He gets, uh, oh, there's that link I told you earlier. He gets a bit anxious when you, when you mess with his clean architecture. Um, you know, he tends to have this kind of reaction. Oh, look how they massacred my boy. And uh, you know, then you, you know, the worst thing happens, and you get sad, Jason. Um, now, I should, I should be very clear. I, I, I'm teasing a bit, because this is not true at all. Jason is actually uh, he's really, really open. Uh, you know, he'll take your call. If you work here at SSW, he'll take your call any time of the day. He's really happy to, to help you through your clean architecture tech questions. He loves feedback. Uh, he, he loves being challenged on what he's doing. Uh, he loves having PRs from the community. Um, if you look at the repo, you'll see there's heaps of community PRs in there as well. So I'm just teasing. It's not true at all. Um, but I just thought that was funny. That's why I put it in. Um, but with that said, let's massacre Jason's boy. So we have here a, um, in fact, I should have kept that running, right? But I'll, I'll show it in a minute. But what we've got here is a solution that I have created uh, using the clean architecture template. And I've adapted it a little bit to suit .NET uh, code sharing across the whole stack. So the first thing that I'm going to show you is this shared project that I've added here. Um, now, you can see here that in, uh, I didn't mean to put that line there. I meant to do that. Um, let's pretend that line, in fact, let's do that again. <laughs> so you can see in this shared project here, oh, I did it again. Woo! This control key is dodgy. Third time's the charm, right? Hey! So you can see in this shared project here, there's those DTOs that you might have recognized from the application project. OK, now the reason that these are in here is because these TTOs are now shared by the presentation layer. So in my UI folder here, I've got my Maui app, right? And this Maui app has a, has a dependency on shared. Uh, in fact, it doesn't. It has an app, a dependency on a client package, which has a dependency on shared. I'm going to talk you through that in a minute, right? Um, but because those DTOs are on here, now in Jason's template, those DTOs had that IMAP from interface. Um, now, I can't use that because then I would be exposing my domain types out to my UI. So instead of doing that, what I've done is I've taken the mapping out of there. If I look in core and if I look at, say, to do lists and queries, let's look at this get to do's. So what I've done, all I've done is I've put the app auto mapper profile in a file. So the auto mapper profile still lives in the same place as the mapping profile lives in JSON's template which is with the queries and commands that it's relevant to. Well, the queries, really. So this automapper profile, which maps from a to-do list to a to-do list DTO, lives with that get to do's query. So it lives in the same place as where it lived in JSON's template. It's just not in the same file anymore. So that's really the change that I've made there. I haven't changed the domain layer at all. I haven't changed the infrastructure layer at all. Um, but what I've done in the presentation layer, uh, I've still got this web UI project. Um, I still got the Angular client app in there, um, not because I want it there, but because in this particular uh, scenario here, I haven't built my Blazor project yet. Um, so the next step will be to build the Blazor project, and then will be to take out the, the Angular app. But it's still there for now. So the web UI uh, project now, where it previously depended on application, it still does. But now, um, because application depends uh, in turn on that shared app, it's got access to those types just like it did before. So how am I sharing that code with the UI? Well, there's one other change that I've made here that I want to show you. So 
I've now got this API client base project. This depends on shared. And in here, I've got a NSWAG generated API client. Okay. Now there's something I've done a little bit differently about this one than what was done in the template. And if we go and look at this NSWAG, uh, con uh, NSWAG definition here, so this is the configuration for how NSWAG generates those clients. The first thing is it's doing is generating a document. And the next thing it's doing is generating this TypeScript client. This is all as it was before. Now, if I search for DTO, you can see that there is this option here that says generate DTO types true. So this is generating those DTOs and putting them in that TypeScript client that lives in the TypeScript project. Um, but I've now added this C-sharp client as well. And if you look in here at the generated DTO types option, you can see that that's set to false because we don't need it. We don't need to generate code that already exists in our shared project because our .NET UI can depend on that. We, we don't need to repeat ourselves. That's a win, right? So, you know what? I'm going to talk a little bit more through the code here in a moment, but why don't we see it in action? So, uh, I've already got this API running here, um, and I've got ngrok, which is giving me a tunnel so that I can reach that API uh, publicly. So, I'm just going to fire this up on my Android emulator here, and we'll see how I've built a, a, a to-do app client uh, in .NET MAUI uh, that will run on Android, Windows, iOS, or Mac OS, all using code that's shared across the stack. Obviously, of course, it has its own code. It's got its own UI code. We can share that too, and we'll talk about that later. But the main thing is that the, the, logic, uh, the logic for talking to the API is in this shared package here that we can share with our Blazor app as well. So I'm going to show you that shortly as well. So a little bit resource intensive because I'm running uh, uh, a few desktops with a few of these different parts of my presentation. Of course, I've got Visual Studio open. Um, I've got an instance of it I didn't need, apparently. Um, I've got an Android emulator running. I've got the API running. Um, so it can be a bit quicker than this a lot of the time. But uh, you know, sometimes you've got to have a little bit of patience as well. So while we're waiting for this to build, I'm just going to talk about some of the code. So we've got this, this API client base package that I talked about here. Now, the, the principle here is that we can share our authentication logic and our API interaction logic across a Blazor UI, which is .NET, and a .NET MAUI UI, which is, it's in the name, .NET. So in here, I've got some authentication types. Uh, I've got some messages, uh, which I'll show you why I, I have that in a moment. I've got an auth handler. This is an HTTP message handler. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to append a bearer token that we're going to get by logging in to any request that goes to the API, so that any request that goes to the API will be authenticated. Um, I've got an auth service that I can use for actually logging in. Uh, I've got some other services here. I've got a base service. Um, and the base service uh, takes in the HTTP client factory and will instantiate an HTTP client. That HTTP client is wired up uh, here and is wired up to use that auth handler that I showed you. So we automatically have uh, an HTTP client that will authenticate all our requests. The base service takes care of that, and then all of these other services that inherit it can inject that HTTP client into the generated clients that are generated by NSWAG so that it can communicate with the API. Um, so what I'm effectively doing is wrapping that client. So all I have to do is wire up uh, the the method here in my dependency injection, this register API client services in my client application, and then I get for free my weather service, my to-do list service, and my to-do item service, which I can inject with these interfaces, don't need to do anything else, and they'll just work. Uh, shall we see if uh, I'm telling the truth? <laughs> so um, one thing that I just want to do very quickly with this UI here is uh, uh, I'm just going to open my UI, and I'm going to make a quick change. Um, so this little black bar at the top here is supposed to be transparent. And if I show you in the XAML here, you can see that I've got the opacity sent to 15%. Uh, now that actually works. It just doesn't work when you start the app. So if I just change that quickly, hot reload will, will apply it. Um, so I just needed to do that. Just It will only apply while it's running for some reason. 
But never mind. Let's see if we can log in using that auth service uh, that's using shared code from the back end. So I'll click log in. It's going to read the discovery document, the OIDC discovery document from, from Identity Server running in the back end. It's giving me a login UI. Let's log in with this Matt at local. P A S S W O R D 1. Ah, oh, sysadmins are going to kill me. I just gave away the admin password. Oops. Okay, so we're logging in. Awesome. Okay, so um, you can see that it says welcome Matt at local. Uh, that's the why I needed that message. Um, so if I show you back in my auth service that I was talking about back here, um, once you log in successfully, it sends that message. Uh, where is it? Here. So this is sending this message here. Um, now I, you know, I, I'm, I could use the message, uh, the messaging center that's built into .NET Maui. Um, but if I do this, which comes from the MVVM community toolkit, I can use this in Blazor as well. So that's cool. So we can see I've got a to-do list here. Um, and this is, uh, it's got the to-do items on it. Um, this is again, this is the seed data that comes out of Jason's template. Uh, I can add a list. Um, let's add NetUG November 2022. Uh, I can pick colors here. This is also, um, th this concept of coloring these lists comes from uh, the API as well. I'm just going to pick, um, um, have we got blue? I'll just pick blue just to annoy Adam. Uh, I better go red, I'll get in trouble. Um, so uh, there we go, there's my list, it's red. Um, I'm just going to add, uh, I'll add a green list as well. Green list. There's my green list. I'm going to add an item to this. So uh, present user group. Great, that's it. Can I tick this off yet? It's kind of in progress. Can I tick this or do I need, I'll leave that for now. I'll do that at the end of the night. Okay, let's get rid of the green list. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Everything's working. Okay, so that is the .NET MAUI UI. As I said, this is running on Android. This will run also on uh, iOS, macOS, or Windows as well. Let's have another look at that code. Okay, so the .NET MAUI app here uh, is dependent on the MAUI API client. And the way that that's wired up uh, is in here. We can see that I'm calling this register MAUI client, which is in that API client app. I'm passing in some information about the authority, the base URL, the client ID. This is mostly auth stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's the that's in the the Maui client, okay? Now the Maui client um, in this register Maui client app, which is uh, method, sorry, which is what I'm calling for my Maui program that program there. Uh, that is registering some services, um, the auth browser that's used for authentication in the Maui app, uh, and a Maui storage provider, so I can securely store. Um, say the refresh token or the access token, whatever. That in turn is calling the uh, uh, the register API client services method, which is in uh, in the API client base package here. Um, that's this one here. And also, you can see that I've added this Blazor API client here, um, which I am not doing anything yet. But that also calls that. When I add my Blazor app, I can put a dependency on the Blazor API client. So the idea here is that I can share my authentication logic and my logic for communicating with the API across both of those UI projects, share that code, full stack code sharing in .NET. Now, before I move on, can anyone see any problems with this approach? I have a question. Yep. Uh, is there a reason as to why you are pushing Maui-specific code out to a dedicated project, the Maui API client, rather than just keeping it in the Maui project? <laughs> OK. So we have a question here from the audience. Um, and um, the question is, I'm just going to repeat the question. Is there a reason why I'm pushing Maui-specific code out to its own project rather than just having it in the Maui project? Um, no, there is no good reason for that whatsoever. Um, and that really wasn't the right way to go. So, <clears throat> okay. Why did you do it? Why did I do it? Well, I was about to answer that. So I got over ambitious, right? I over engineered this solution. I started off, as I said, I wanted to have shared code across my full stack. I wanted to share my logic for, for talking to the API and authenticating across you know across you know the the Maui app and the the Blazor app 
So I started doing it and then I thought, oh, well, that, you know, when I started uh, getting into the meat of building the authentication, you know, parts of it didn't work, wouldn't make sense on Blazor. Then there was the storage, as I said, for storing. Um, so in this auth service here, um, you know, what the first, what I do is I inject uh, into here my um, storage, secure storage provider because Maui, because it's running on a, on a proper operating system and not in a browser, can use encryption to save secrets. But Blazor can't, so I thought, well, the compromise is that I'll just store it in local storage on Blazor. So I was injecting that in here, and then I was like, well, that means I have to do a different implementation on Blazor and Maui. And, uh, uh, you know, so I started, you know, I started doing that, and, you know, and then I came up with this approach here. Um, the question, the second question from the audience here, the follow-up question was, why? And that's a really good question. And as I said, why? Because I got ambitious and I over-engineered it. This is not the right way to do it, okay? That Maui-specific code, as Luke in the audience here just said, should be in the Maui app. The Blazor-specific code should be in the Blazor app. Has anyone else noticed a problem with that last comment that I just made? Where is the Blazor app? I haven't even started with the Blazor app yet. Why? Why? Why is this here? Why is this here? It's a mess. It's not a mess. It's just over-engineered. This is one of the traps that you can fall into. And I'm going to come back to this later on. But the point is you don't want to over-engineer. And it's so easy when you start thinking about this stuff and you think, I want to share code everywhere. So I'm, you know, this is going to go here and that's going to go there. What I should have done here was I shouldn't even have done this API client base package, let alone these other ones. I should have just built the Maui app and made it work. Then when I added the Blazor app, I could have said, well, I don't need to rewrite this code because it's here. I could have refactored and taken that code that is relevant to both and taken it back a layer to a class library that they can, they can both depend on. And that's a really important concept that, again, I'm going to come back to later on. Well, I'm going to show you, um, I just want to explain actually that this, isn't, this is a work in progress. It's not finished yet, but I am going to show you where it's up to so far. Okay, so I am in the process of refactoring this. I'm in the process of undoing my over-engineering. Uh, and the first thing that I've done is I've got rid of those three client packages and I've just got the one API client package here now, the class library. And this just includes, in the authentication context here, it includes the auth handler because they both use that. But Maui and Blazor authenticate in different ways. So it didn't make sense to share that authentication logic. I've got rid of the messages because I no longer need to use, uh, I no, need, no longer need to send that message about logging in because again, Blazor does it differently. So now in my Maui app, um, it, I've got the auth service here. And in the Maui app, I am uh, just using the built-in uh, secure storage. So no need to abstract that to an interface. And messaging center. Quick question about messaging center. Who is uh, following the development of .NET Maui? Anyone? So um, in an ironic twist, in .NET 7, Messaging Center is deprecated, and they say to use uh, the messaging service from the MVVM community toolkit that I took out. So go figure. There you go. Um, but anyway, all this, the, the auth browser here is now in the Maui app. As, as Luke said in the audience earlier, why, why isn't it in the Maui app? It should be, and it is now. Okay? Um, but then back to, uh, back to this, this, this client package here, I've still got the services, because those are still relevant. I've still got the auth handler. Um, Still wiring all that stuff up here. Uh, and I can call that now from my, uh, my Maui program. My Maui app has a dependency on the one client package. And now I've got a Blazor app. And the Blazor app also has a dependency on that client, that client package there. And in fact, um, just to elaborate, as, as I said, that client package uh, has that shared project as a dependency as well. So both of those UI projects now have code that's shared across the full stack in a way that makes sense to them. And that's the, one of the key concepts here. Um, so the Blazor app is a work in progress. Um, I might just fire it up quickly. Um, so I haven't yet wired up um, those services or, or in fact built the UI for the to-do lists, um, but I have started to build the main UI, uh, and the main thing is the login. The login logic works. So here's our Blazor app, um, and I can click login, 
No, I can't. It was a network error. Network error. Oh, you know what it is? Uh, the problem is that I have not updated my uh, my ngrok URL in that Blazor project. So I'm just going to grab that, and I'm going to go to here. Oh, no, that should still work. I shouldn't need the ngrok URL. Anyway, as I said, work in progress. Um, so anyone that wants to keep an eye on this, please do. Um, I'm going to keep working on this, and I'll get that Blazor app fully functional, fully armed and operational, like the Maui app. Luke? GitHub URL. I have, yes, I'm going to share that at the end. Um, so yeah, it's on GitHub, you, you guys can keep an eye on the development of it. Uh, and of course, you're welcome to play with it as well. Um, any questions so far? So you can see how I'm sharing code across the full stack, and you can see how I started out being over-ambitious, over-engineering it, and then you can see how I've refactored it a bit to kind of do what I should have done at the start and, and really just focus on what I need and not what I think I need. Question? Yes, Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you, you started off by showing the end swag uh, definition. And basically you said, OK, so when I'm trying to use a .NET project, I've, I've essentially switched off this feature to export DTOs because they now exist in this shared library. Sorry, could you start the question again? Okay. Uh, you started off by, by showing the NSWAG definition and showing that when you are uh, using another .NET to UI facing project, say like the Maui app or what have you, you're switching off this DTO generation option because your DTOs live inside of this shared project, right? So obviously this is a lot of work just to be able to switch that Boolean to false to generate your DTOs elsewhere. Um, can you just sort of cover the other sections of code again or just a flyby of, of areas of code functionality that this solves outside of just those DTOs? <clears throat> so if I understand the question, uh, you're asking, so what I've done here is, is shared DTOs. And I'm, I'm not repeating myself because I'm not sharing DTOs anymore. right? And the question was, what other problems am I solving? So the main problem that I'm solving with this is it's not just sharing the DTOs. Uh, that's kind of a bonus. Uh, the, main, the main benefit here of this approach is that all of my logic for interacting with the API lives in this uh, class library here called uh, Maui clean -to -do .API client. So in here, we've got these services that I mentioned. We've got an auth handler, not, not uh, authentication for logging in, but authorizing the, uh, the HTTP requests. Um, we've got some, the, the, the generated client types, the generated client classes, sorry, live in here. And we've got some dependency injection logic and some global usings. This is used by the Blazor app and the .NET MAUI app. So it's not just uh, the DTOs that are shared. The DTOs are shared across the stack. That's cool. But the thing that's really cool is that all of this logic here that lets me talk to my API make authenticated requests to the API, execute commands and queries, can be used by the Blazor project and the .NET MAUI project all by using that shared code. OK. You can also take it a step further, right? So we have some really cool extension methods on HTTP client now that means that we could probably get away with, get, do away with the generated clients altogether. And in these services here, you know, are really doing simple stuff. Um, you know, I, I can just, you know, like in this, this get async here, um, probably not a good, probably not a good example. Why don't I open up the to-do lists one? So uh, if I look at this uh, get to-dos here, we can see that this is returning a view model um, and, you know, the client, the method is returning a task of that view model. Um, so you, you can see that here. Um, we don't really need that anymore because with with HTTP client now, there's extension methods which is get from JSON async. So I can just specify the view model type, use the the HTTP client, set the base address on it, set the types on it. I could get rid of the NSWAG generated stuff altogether here, and uh, that's actually something that I'm going to do in the next step. So you know now we've we've shared code, uh, we've shared the logic, we've shared those uh, 
those UI DTO types. And I'm going to take it a step further and just get rid of more generated code. Thanks, Luke. Any other questions before I move on? OK. Um, um, I'm going to come back to that one at the end. Um, all right. So let's just go back. So we had a look at a demo here. We saw how we uh, massacred Jason's boy. And um, I spoke a little bit about um, uh, how you can share code. And I spoke a little bit about how not to, not to share code. Let's talk a bit more about how not to share code. Uh, traps to watch out for. I want to come back to this principle that I mentioned earlier, which is dry. Don't repeat yourself. And I'm going to read this again. It says, Every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. So there are two key words in that statement, um, in my opinion. Does anyone, anyone care to guess what they are, what I think they are? OK. In my opinion, the key words here are knowledge and authoritative. Now, dry can often be interpreted to mean just don't repeat anything, like, oh my god. In fact, you know, we'll look at that in a moment. We're going to look at an example of that in a moment. But I want you to remember the key words are knowledge and authoritative. These are the things that don't get, so knowledge doesn't get repeated, and there's one authoritative representation of it within a system. And I'm going to come back to that. So um, for people to write dry code, and for people to you know, avoid repetition, these are some of the traps that I see people fall into uh, commonly, most commonly, in the code that I work on. The first trap is deep hierarchies. There's a little yo-yo emoji there, because uh, uh, that represents what's called the yo-yo problem. Has anyone here heard of the yo-yo problem? Yep. Um, so I'll just explain it. The yo-yo problem is when you've got a deep hierarchy and a deep dependency graph, and you have to go like this, like a yo-yo, looking up and down the dependency graph to try and understand it. Okay. So let's look at an example. Okay. So one example is you might have these. This is obviously a contrived example, but you might have these two classes here. We've got a person class with a, a string ID property, a, a string name property, and a date time date of birth property. We've got a product class, which also has an ID, also has a name, also both strings, and has a manufacturer name. Okay. Now, a developer who wants to keep their code dry looks at this, comes along, and says, why the heck are these two properties in more than one class? Not good enough. So they refactor it. Okay. So you've got a, you don't want to repeat that ID and that name. So you've got a base entity, right? And then you've got your person, which inherits that base entity. And you've got your product, which inherits that base entity. So far, so good. Uh, either, is any of this knowledge, or is it authoritative? It's not, right? So that's only the first part of the problem. What happens then when you want to add uh, uh, another class, right, uh, called a temperature record, which also has uh, 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 an ID, but doesn't have a name, OK? So you go, OK, so you refactor it, right? So now you've got your base entity, which just has ID. Then you've got your base named entity, which inherits base entity. That adds the name. Person and product inherit the base named entity. Temperature record inherits the base entity. <sighs> OK. This is a bad refactor. OK. Now, the reason is, the reason this is a bad refactor is that you just don't need to do it. OK. So there's, no, there's nothing wrong with repeating types, uh, repeating properties across different types. And the other thing here is that. Uh, you violated the Liskov substitution principle. Okay, um, does anyone know what the Liskov substitution principle is? Um, so I'll explain. Um, so in object-oriented programming, we have these principles called the solid principles. Uh, S O L I D. They all stand for different things. I'm not going to go through those now, but the L stands for the Liskov substitution principle. Now, what the Liskov substitution principle says is that any inherited type should be able to stand in for its for its Base type, okay. Um, uh, in fact, what it specifically says is that a, 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 any class should be open to extension but closed to modification. Uh, I'm talking about two different principles here. Sorry, the O in solid is the open and closed principle, which says that it should be 
open to e extension and close to modification. That's actually what we violated here, right? So we've, we've modified it, right, rather than extending things. So that's the first problem. Uh, the Liskov substitution principle says that an inherited type should be able to stand in for its base type. And when, when you use inheritance, that's why you do it. Not to share properties. You don't need to share properties, OK? You use inheritance to, to basically do the Liskov substitution principle. Now, a better way to think of that is that an inherited type, a derived type, is a version of the base type. That's really what, what you use inheritance for, OK? So if your dependency graph starts to look like the Windsor family tree, you got some problems. Um, <laughs> OK, um, <clears throat> so this is a code smell. Um, and there is an answer to this code smell. Um, and uh, what you do instead is you do this kind, of, this kind of refactoring, right? So the person has an ID. It has a given name, has a family name. It's got a date of birth and an address. The company has an ID, a company name. Uh, and it's got a type of person. So it doesn't need to inherit all those other properties. Uh, and it's got an address as well. Um, so rather than company and person both inheriting a base class that's got the address properties in it, you compose it, right? So the principle is, oh, look at that. Let me see if I can fix this. I've got these in the wrong Z order. Favor composition over inheritance. That's how you avoid the yo-yo problem, right? And that's how you avoid that code smell. So when, you're, when you want to not repeat yourself, you don't repeat yourself by composing things, OK? You don't want to do it by inheriting things. Favor composition over inheritance. OK. So then the question comes up. How do I share like properties between classes? Well, we've, you know, you don't, you don't right? You use, you use composition. If you have things that are common across different types, put them in their own class, share them that way. If it's logic that you want to share, or if it's knowledge, you can use an interface, right? You, you know, you, you, that, that's how you do it. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but this is one of the biggest problems that I've seen, uh, and that is how you avoid it. Trap number two, you ain't going to need it. Who's heard of this before? Yagni, you ain't going to need it. Yeah. Um, so you can see in my little emoji there, that's me showing that, that you, I over-engineered it, right? Um, now there's this cool XKCD cartoon here. Can you pass the salt? Big pause. I said, I know. I'm developing a system to pass you arbitrary condiments. It's been 20 minutes. It'll save time in the long run. Um, who here has heard of XKCD? Yeah, love, love, love XKCD. Um, uh, who here, uh, you guys know Matt Wicks from SSW, uh, SSW Solution Architect Matt Wicks. He's got a, a t-shirt that he wears frequently with an XKCD cartoon on it. Right, um, but yeah, over engineering, you ain't going to need it, right? So, this is an example I showed you earlier, right? I jumped the gun, didn't need it. So, just start with what you need, right? Don't just don't over engineer it. And I'm going to come back to to exp expand on this in a in a moment. Um, but one way to avoid it is I like this principle of just in time rather than just in case. So, if you're building something, if you're writing some code, ask yourself the question. Am I building this because I need it, or am I building this because I might need it? Just in time rather than just in case. Uh, another thing you can do is use clean architecture. So clean architecture inherently lends itself to kind of really shoehorning you into uh, the pit of success. You guys heard of the, the concept of the pit of success? So it's, it's like this idea of this graph that, um, you know, where, where things get harder and then they get easier. You get this pit, and then it gets harder to get out of the pit of success. So the, the, the point is that the easiest way to do something is the right way. So that's kind of, so, so yeah, the, the clean architecture uh, approach really nudges you towards the pit of success. So getting back to, so following on on Yagni and, and how to avoid it and uh, the example that I showed you here, um, I like to think of it like this. There's a quote here. Maintainable code is not code that you don't have to refactor. It's code that you can refactor easily. This was said by me just now. Um, so that's what that quote's from. I, I mean, I, kind of, I, did, I did look around for, for um, uh, smarter people than me that have, have said this as a principle. Um, and it's not that it's not out there. I just couldn't find it. So um, if anyone knows of the right quote that I can use here instead of something I've made up, I'd, I'd love to hear it. 
Um, but yeah, you, you know, the, the point is that, you know, you don't need it. Don't over-engineer it. Just start with what you need and you can refactor it. If you're writing maintainable clean code, you can refactor it. Don't try and write things that you don't have to refactor. That's not the way to go. Bonus tip, clarity over brevity, okay? Now, this is kind of related to over-engineering and it's kind of related to uh, the inheritance stuff. So if you're trying to be clever and you're trying to not repeat yourself and you're trying to have all this big dependency graph just to keep things brief, don't do it. But if I'm being honest, the real reason why I wanted to show you this was because I was looking at uh, videos around meeting topics earlier and I found this clip which is super, super relevant. Um, so if this starts from the right position, Oh, please. Trip, I think you're onto something with this idea. I really like it. Carol, did you get that down? Yeah, okay. Let me just pause that. Um, I hope that you guys can hear that on the live stream. I'm just going to turn up the volume here in the office. Uh, question to the audience, could you hear that okay? No. Yeah, I'm going to turn that up a bit, and I'm going to play that again. Oh, there we go. So I'm just going to play that again. Um, Carol, did you get that down? Yep, okay. Sorry, what is C test up sub YT pros? Well, I'm abbreviating to make room for all these great ideas. Contest, uploading it to YouTube, funniest, and you get a prize. Wait, where are the other ideas? Yeah, I, I just thought that was relevant because, you know, you kind of see that as well. Especially when new language features come out, you often see people go, oh, you know, I can use the spread operator in JavaScript. And then, you know, everyone else looks at it and scratches their head and takes six months to get used to it. And, yeah, you get the same thing in .NET as well. Um, but, you know, clarity over brevity. Um, I, the example that comes to mind with this is, is often when you see uh, Lambda functions, right? Uh, in .NET, and you, uh, particularly in link queries, where you've you've got a type and you go x and then your arrow function x dot, which is fine. And then except when you start doing relationships and then you've got y dot, just go customer or cust dot, and then you know order dot. Just it's just easier. Be clear, uh, and that's kind of the example that that comes to mind when I'm talking about clarity over brevity. But the real reason I'm showing this is is about that dependency graph, right? Don't try and not repeat yourself and keep everything brief by just having these big dependency chains. It's okay. It's okay to have more than one class in your project that has an int property called ID. ID. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. So, the thing to bear in mind is that you want to share your code, but you want it to make sense. You want it to be sensible. Okay. So, share your code. Um, write your full stack solution. Write it in clean architecture. Share your code as long as it makes sense. But if you find that you're jumping through hoops to keep your code dry, if you find that you're doing some mental gymnastics to keep your code dry, don't do it. Keep your code wet. Make that code rain, OK? Um, so wet, by the way, is a, is a kind of a, a antonym. Is that the right word, antonym, to, to dry? It's, it stands for write everything twice. Um, but the, po yeah, the point is that, that you, know, you don't have to do that. But the point is just don't. Don't butcher your code just for the sake of sharing it. Keep it simple, keep it clean. Now, uh, this is the Python logo, and I think there's an interesting lesson that we can all learn from Python uh, to help us with this, uh, which I, I, I have to admit, I haven't done much Python yet. Um, super popular in the machine learning crowd. I'm really keen to do it because I want to do some IoT stuff, and it's good for IoT as well. Um, this is a really cool concept. I found this, uh, this, this quote on, a, on a, a Y Combinator forum. And it says here, damn it, people, in Python, that's clever is an insult. And I love that. And I think the philosophy is, um, who, does anyone know why Python is called Python? Do you want to share? I'll share. It's called Python. It's named after Monty Python, right? The, uh, the comedy troupe. Because the idea is that it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be simple. It's supposed to be fun. That's what it's all about, right? And that's why this that's clever is an insult. If you've done something that's clever, that's, you, you're doing it wrong, right? The philosophy of Python is just make it fun, make it simple. Um, so I think that's something that we can, all, we can all learn. So we've spoken about code sharing within a solution. I want to talk about code sharing plus plus, OK? So the code sharing in, in, in the solution that we've looked at is one way, but this is now enterprise code sharing. Now, there's an example here uh, uh, called Maui Stock Take, made for a company called Mildred. Uh, I'm not going to go too, too much detail about what that is. Adam mentioned earlier that I'm writing a book called .NET Maui in Action. This is actually from my book. Um, 
this looks a bit complex, but I'm just going to explain what's going on here. Okay, so we've got the uh, the stock take API, uh, and then we've got the uh, the client, and that's the client package that we saw earlier, and that is being used by the the, the Maui app. Um, now, as well as the Maui app, if we want to build more apps and we're an enterprise, you know, not just building one app, we want, uh, you know, more apps. We want to share the look and feel and the UI and the UX. So we can actually take the controls and instead of building them in the Maui app, we can put them into a .NET Maui control library and we can share that with a future .NET Maui project. Now, we don't need that yet, so we're not going to do that today. We're going to do that in the future when we need to, okay? We've also got a, a, a customer portal. Now, the customer portal also talks to the stock take API because customers want to see what stock's available. So that uses the API client. Uh, and then we've got a, a, a Blazor web app, which is dependent on that. And we've also got a .NET MAUI Blazor app, okay? So the UI in those is a Razor class library that's shared between them. So now we're not just sharing code in our solution, we're sharing code across our whole enterprise. And there's different ways you can do this, but they're basically class libraries, the same way that we've always shared code in .NET. Um, and you can share these on a NuGet feed. Our NuGet feed can be uh, publicly on NuGet. It can be you can host private or, or public NuGet feeds on GitHub. Um, a NuGet feed can literally be a network share. There's all kinds of other uh, uh, third-party options out there as well. So you can share all this UI code and, and you know all this this business logic where appropriate across your whole enterprise. Um, I showed some examples of both of these approaches in a talk that I did last year called uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Mobile. Um, I'm going to give you a link at the end to watch that and give you a link to the code samples. But effectively, in there, I had a... Um, oh, you remember at the beginning that I said that I was really into homebrewing? So uh, for my demo for that, I, I, I built a homebrewing app. Um, and I'm sharing the code in that one using a, a NuGet feed, and that's how I'm doing that client package. Um, I also showed a, a real-time chat application using Maui Blazor and, and Blazor uh, and SignalR, and that's using that Razor class library shared approach. So I've got some demos that, that I'll give you links to later for that. Now, on the subject of my book, um, <laughs> a bit of shameless self-promotion. Um, anyone that is here tonight or watching this can actually get 35% off using that code there. So if you use that link, that's going to take you to the Manning website. Manning are the publisher. That QR code will take you to that link as well. Um, uh, do you know what? Don't hold me to this, but I'm pretty sure that that code will give you 35% off anything, not just my book. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. So use that link. Um, if you go to that website, search for .NET Maui in action, um, and you can get you can get the book at 35% off. I wouldn't do it this week. Um, well, I mean, you can, but there's already 35% off this week. Um, so if you don't do it this week, don't use the code this week is what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> get what you want this week. Use the code next week for something else. So some other useful resources. Um, so I mentioned uh, Jason, has done, Jason has done something similar. So he's actually got, in addition to his clean architecture template, he's got a template called Rapid Blazor. Um, and this is using a somewhat similar approach to what I've showed you. He's done it slightly differently. Um, and you know you, you can look at the repo and you can find out how he's done it. But it's the same principle as sharing code. Now this is all about also rapidly building a, a, a full a full solution, including infrastructure and deploying and everything. It's really really cool, really worth a look. But that's using a Blazor UI and that's sharing code as well. Um, there's a link to my talk uh, that I mentioned earlier, Cloudy with a Chance of Mobile. Uh, that's the Cloudy Mobile repo, which is the the homebrewing one that I mentioned. Um, and that's Maui Chat, which is the, the chat app that I mentioned as well. So um, I did say earlier on in the talk that um, right at the start, in fact, that if you downloaded and installed the uh, SSW Rewards app, I was going to give you a code to scan that's going to give you 500 points. Um, so whip out your phones, scan that QR code, get 500 points for attending this talk, watching this talk. And then um, you know when you've, when you've built up enough points, you can score yourself uh, an SSW Keep Cup uh, a me band. Um, that Google Nest Hub is not a claimable uh, prize that you can claim through building up points, but it's a, a prize that you can win by going into draws. And if you're on the app and if you're scanning QR codes, you go into draws. And we have draws all the time. We give away some really cool stuff. Um, NDC Sydney recently, actually, we gave away uh, an Xbox, a, a Switch, Nintendo Switch, heaps of cool stuff. So definitely worth worth checking out. So there's another QR code here. I should have the URL as well, but I don't. Um, but I'll get you guys the URL. Uh, let me just check, actually. Is it behind here? No. 
I'll have to grab the URL. Um, if you scan this QR code, it's going to take you to a form where you can give me some feedback about this talk or about SSW in general. General, um, I'd really, really appreciate uh, your feedback. Let me know what you liked about this talk. Let me know what you didn't like. Let me know what you want to hear more of. Um, so uh, please scan the QR code. Uh, let me know what you think of the talk. Really, really keen for your feedback. This presentation and all of SSW's presentations are available on GitHub. So you can go to the link here and you can get the, the, the presentation that you've seen tonight. You can get the, any other presentations available from SSW that you've seen in the past or in the future. That is it from me. I'm really, really thankful for everyone coming along tonight. Um, thank you. Where's the GitHub URL? Oh, you're right. I don't. Have, I should have given. Have it. All right, Goldie. Great presentation. Thank you, Adam. I now know when I walk up to someone and go, "Why does it work like that?" and then I understand it, and then I say, "That's clever." <laughs> that I'm insulting them. Only if, if they're had... only if they're a Python developer. Right. Okay. So if they had to explain it to me, there's something wrong. Okay. Cool. Cool. So I have some questions here. I'll read you a few. All right. Let's uh, let's ask this one. I like this one. So you've talked a lot about how important it is to share code across an application. Obviously, that's important. But let's assume that you you kick off two different projects and you're involved with them. One is, um, say, an invoicing program, and one is an induction program. So there's two different ones. Would you? Where were those examples came yeah, from? Yeah, <laughs> using a real example. Yeah. How would you plan to share code between those when they're different? The first question is, if they're different, why do you need to? Well, there might be some common um, UI elements. There might be some common uh, generic libraries. Yeah. Mm. So within a company, you might do a lot of things consistently. Yeah. So really, if you if you look at this slide that I showed here, this is how I would plan it. OK, so I would have <clears throat> um, a dot net class library that would contain logic for uh, interacting with those the APIs that are backing those systems um, and those can be used by either consuming application so if you've got a UI client that uses it don't forget the other API can also use that as well to talk to you know API A can talk to API B if you're sharing UI depending on what the UI is if it's if it's blazer you could use a razor class library and um, if it's uh, you know that, that's if it's Maui blazer or you know blazer wasm uh, or you know blazer server uh, if it's a .NET Maui app you know you can and particularly if you've got like enterprise branding and you want all of your apps to look the same, mm -hmm. you've got common controls like your buttons and your different layouts. Mm -hmm. You can take those out of your app and you can put them in a shared UI component library that all of the consuming applications can use. Mm -hmm. So as I said, the first question is, is do you need to? And if you don't need to, then you don't do it. But then as you need to, as you identify those needs, you can start refactoring. And remember, really important point um, is this one, right? You sh don't be afraid of refactoring your code. If you can refactor your code, that's good, right? Don't don't plan to not have to. Plan to be able to. And that's again going back to the quote that that um, or the message we had from Jason about um, an application being able to last 20 years rather than mm. three years. You can't. You don't know what's going to happen in 20 years' mm. time. But if you're writing code that's clean and then it is easily refactorable, it's going to last. Okay. So along the same lines, let's just say that you decide. Look, it would be really nice if these two applications could share this piece, but you're twisting yourself into a pretzel trying to make that work. So you decide we're going to use the wet principle, we're going to write it there, and we're going to copy and paste and put it over there. What uh, steps do you take to indicate which is the master, or what What would you do? Just leave a, leave a copy and hope <coughs> nobody notices or call it out? I'm a big fan of, of taking the easy road as much as possible. What I would do in that situation, I'm assuming here that you've started by trying to share this code and trying to refactor it in a way that's logical to use in both. Um, so I, you know, I, you know, you're struggling, you're tying yourselves in circles, <laughs> um, you're tying yourselves in circles, and you're jumping through hoops, and it's just not working. In that situation, I would probably park both of those. And I would start fresh. I'd start a fresh project, a fresh class library, and I'd say, if this was Greenfield, what would I do? And I'd start building that up from scratch. Mm. 
Um, and then I would start making that a dependency of those two projects and, you know, basically phase out the code that's in there. Um, yeah, you know, if, you, if you're tying yourself up in knots, you're making it too hard. All right. So basically you said uh, divide and conquer and don't do wet. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. I have a question here. Uh, can you make a base entity if you need to enable soft deletes? Yes, of course. Because I can't remove because it exists for a purpose, like soft deleting and caching. Yeah, that's a that's a perfectly valid uh, reason to to share a property between. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying don't have a base entity. Absolutely, have a base entity. Uh, and it was a contrived example, um, and I really didn't. And I, I apologise if if that came across as me saying don't do that. Mm. I, I was really trying to illustrate. Um, you know, a, a share property for doing soft delete makes sense to share. But saying I don't want two properties that both ha I don't want two classes that both have a name property doesn't make sense. Right. So okay. yeah, absolutely share properties for soft delete. Okay. Another one here. Clean architecture uses DTOs all over the application layer. I like to use domain models everywhere and view models when I want to display differently. I think this is compliant to the clean architecture principles because the API looks at the application and that looks at the domain. What do you think? Um, <clears throat> Luke Parker, by the way. Yeah. Um, Luke, you know, Luke Parker is uh, is uh, very skillful at this stuff as well. He's very, also very knowledgeable about clean architecture. Um, and I think that, um, to be honest, what he's saying there is a question of semantics. Um, so view models are, are really just another type of DTO. Mm. Um, the difference between a view model, you know, so normally when you say DTO, you're talking about um, a type that's that's meant for transferring data that kind of represents an entity in your domain. Whereas when you're talking about a view model, you're talking about a type that transfers data that meets the needs of a view in your UI. Uh, now, of course, in .NET MAUI, uh, we have the MVVM pattern and view model means something else entirely, mm -hmm. um, which I don't really want to go into. So I, I think really what he's saying there is kind of the same thing. We're just using a different term. So, you know, with, with what he's just described, do you mind if I just read that again? Yeah, clean architecture uses DTOs all over the application layer. I like to use domain models everywhere and view models when I want to display it differently. I think this is compliant to clean architecture principles because the API looks at the application and that looks at the domain. Yeah, okay. So so what we're talking about here, right, is the difference. It's, it really is the same approach, mm -hmm. except for what he's doing is, is he's saying that my view model will just contain, it wouldn't need to be built up of sub-DTO types, and that's fine. Um, it just depends on, on your need. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have another one here. Does .NET MAUI support push notifications with Firebase? Uh, that's a good question, and the answer is absolutely 100% yes. Um, it, it does, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, does .NET MAUI project types have restrictions on referencing assemblies that might target or enhance only one specific platform, such as .NET 7 Windows? No. Um, did I close Visual Studio? Or have I still got it open? No. So it, it actually supports that, um, and it's it's quite clever. Um, don't tell a Python dev. Um, <laughs> So, so uh, you know, you can use you can use these conditions here. So you can see that. The, so th this is using. Um, so from .NET six onwards, you have what's called these TFMs, which is Target Framework Monikers, mm -hmm. uh, and that lets you do uh, multi-targeting. So do you remember I said with Xamarin you have multiple projects. Mm -hmm. So you would have your uh, your shared project, you'd have your your iOS project, and you would have your Android project. You don't need that now because using multi-targeting, you can target multiple projects. You can target multiple frameworks. From the same project, and then you can use these conditions here. So you can see that with this, with this Windows one, um, um, oh, I was I've missed showing something cool. And you can see that there's some conditions here for what you do when you're targeting Windows. And there's this one here that I've added in, which um, there was a video by Gerald Valui from Microsoft on the Maui team showing you how to do unit tests. I, I meant to show that I've actually got unit tests in here as well, <laughs> also sharing that code. Um, and the one cool thing about the full stack.net solution is that I can go to um, Test Explorer here in uh, Visual Studio and I can see, oh, it's on the wrong screen, let me just bring that across. I can see all of my tests for the UI, the API, everything in there. Um, but to enable that to work, um, if the target framework is not.NET 6, i.e. if it's.NET 6 for Android, 
iOS, Mac had to list, or Windows, the output type is an executable. Otherwise, uh, it's not an executable, it's just a class library. Mm. That means that I can import it into my tests, which aren't one of those target platforms, and run my tests as well. Wow, awesome. Okay, well that's fantastic. Um, I have plenty more. Uh, I'll just ask one more, and then I'll ask my own. Python uses whitespace to group blocks of code. <laughs> do you think that's clever? <laughs> uh, do I think it's I think clever? Piers is being a troll here. <laughs> Um, is Piers a Python dev? No, I think he's okay. trying to, to, to take the opposite approach to uh, okay. practice he's arguing. Okay. Um, uh, question for Piers, who, um, for anyone watching online, is, is in the audience here. Piers, what do you think of YAML? Uh, not a fan. Right, okay. I'm not a fan of YAML. <laughs> do you think, you don't think it's clever? No. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess it's a matter of taste. Um, Have you done XAML builds? No. No, see? He hasn't been through all the pain. He's too young. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, uh, final question, just from me. Um, you know, you did a hell of a lot of mobile solutions. You've done heaps of Xamarin. We know Xamarin didn't rule the world, and we know that it's kind of an equal world with Xamarin and Flutter and React Native, etc. Uh, what do you think of the version that Microsoft have done here uh, for your happiness? And what do you think that the success of this looks like over the next five years? Um, so there's two, I think there's two facets to that. The first is the architectural changes, the way that they, the way that you build and develop a .NET MAUI project compared to what you did for Xamarin is, is just, it's so much better. It just makes things much easier. Um, like I said, that you've got one project rather than three or four or however many. Um, the way that you reference and use resources, the way that you've got the, it's using the, the generic host builder pattern, so we get all the familiar stuff that we're used to as .NET developers. Um, the fact that we've got one .NET now, so previously you had .NET standard was what you needed for, for Xamarin, now it's just .NET. Uh, it, uh, it, honestly, it's, it's, it's like a dream um, compared to what you did before. Um, now, with that said, we've just had .NET 7 come out last week. Um, so .NET MAUI came out. Um, it was scheduled to come out with .NET 6 a year ago. It was delayed because it wasn't finished. It came out in May. It wasn't finished in May. Um, and to an extent, it's a work in progress now. So, so um, I guess, it, it, I mean, it's worth pointing out that it is a rebuild. It's not just a new version of Xamarin. It's, it's, it's got the same DNA as Xamarin. Um, but it's kind of it's been rebuilt from the ground up. So there there are some teething issues still. Um, I actually just made a decision with the publisher today to say that the book is .NET 7 minimum, even though .NET MAUI is is .NET 6 onwards. I'm saying in the book you can do it with .NET 6 if you want, but there's just there was there was too many gotchas and too many extra bits in the book that I I didn't want in there just to say ah oh, you know watch out for this thing watch out for that thing that that you don't have that problem with .NET 7. And the problems that, you, that are still there now, you're not going to have in .NET 8. So I think, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a million times easier than Xamarin to, to build a, a project with, with .NET MAUI. Um, and by the time we get to .NET 8, I, I think it will be, it will be king. It, it's, it's not going to have any of the problems that, that we had. Um, it's going to be awesome. And, and I think that all .NET developers, if you want to build a UI, should look at it. Okay. Um, it's just it's it just you use your existing skill set, and I, I like XAML because I know XAML. You don't have to use XAML. You can write your UI in C sharp code. Um, if you're a .NET dev and you want to build a mobile or desktop app, just just do it. Just do Maui. Mm. Um, you you asked about Flutter and React Native as well. Yeah, they're both pretty cool. Um, I I don't really like them, um, but that's not to say they're bad. That's just that I don't like them. But the biggest problem that they have, particularly in the context of tonight's talk, is they're not .NET. Mm. So that was a super good, super long answer that answered half of my question. What was the other half? <laughs> what do you think of it? Like, I now, now know you're super happy. Yeah. What do you think that the success of this is going to be in the next five years compared with those other opposing frameworks? Um, I, I think it has the potential to be very successful. Um, it depends on a few things. I, I think... Um, I think Xamarin didn't didn't appeal to .NET devs that much. Um, it did initially. It did initially. The, the tremendous buzz. Yeah. But then everybody started he hearing war stories and yeah, you know, it's not that simple. Yeah, you know, Xamarin was always for experts. Uh, again, I talk about this in the book, right? When I when I 
wanted to, I learned Xamarin not because I was already a, an Android developer and an iOS developer and a .NET developer and I was like, oh, now I can just use these .NET and Android, uh, iOS and Android APIs in .NET. I was someone who knew .NET and wanted to build mobile apps, right? So of course I've learned more about those platforms mm -hmm. and their APIs now, um, but, but I found the learning curve and the barrier to entry incredibly high. Um, and I think that was the problem is, is, you know, the awesome buzz around it was, wow, you can write these mobile apps in .NET and then .NET developers are like, okay, cool. And they crack it open. They're like, I can't do this. It's too hard. Mm. Um, with .NET Mail, you don't have that problem. Like it, it's much more top down than bottom up. Of course, you're going to be a much better .NET Maui developer if you familiarize yourself with those target platform APIs. Um, so, uh, but you don't have to start from there. You don't have to start from that mm. position of expertise. And I think that's the real difference. Um, now, I think if Microsoft can focus on the marketing um, and get the message right, and really listen to .NET devs. Yeah, you know, at the moment they're listening to the .NET Maui devs, and they have to, right? Because they have to get all the things fixed, and they have to get it right. But then, if they can start listening to the .NET devs and start appealing to them and saying, you know, why aren't you building? Why aren't you building your apps in .NET Maui? And I think it's got the potential to be very successful. Um, and the first thing that, that they can do is have an answer for when devs respond by saying, why aren't you? Um, so, what do you mean? Why so, you? so if, if Microsoft say to devs, why aren't you building your apps in .NET MAUI? And devs say, well, why aren't you? Oh, <laughs> burn. Yeah. Yeah, so we need some quintessential great apps out We do, there. we do. Yeah. I have a suggestion for Microsoft. Okay. Like, we use the Authenticator app, what, 20 times a day, 10 times a day, Yeah. at least every day. If they just built that, that little guy in uh, .NET MAUI, they yeah. can say, there is a massively used app, and it works beautifully. Yeah. Mm. The Xbox app. The, the Xbox, Xbox app. app. Yeah. Yeah. The Xbox app. Yeah. yeah. You know, Microsoft really should uh, leverage that Xbox brand more. You know, mm. when Windows Phone came out, it wasn't as successful as it could have been because consumers don't really like Windows. They don't. Well, they don't care about it, but they do care about Xbox. If that was the Xbox Phone. Could have been identical. Would have sold heaps more. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, Matt. Thank you for putting together a beautiful presentation. Thanks for writing that book. There's a Thanks lot so. of effort into putting all these things together. He does a uh, heap for the community. Uh, I think we had a great night tonight. Uh, start building mobile apps. I feel like we're on the beginnings of something special for mobile development. Um, and this is Adam Kogan, and I'll see you in the next one. one more Cheers. Thing. Oh, one more thing. Hmm? Um, so I, I, can I ask you, what were your two favorite questions? Because I want to give away free copies. Of oh, to give away two books. All right. Um, I will say I liked Luke Parker's one, challenging. Yeah. Okay. And I also liked uh, Piers's one. Um, and I thought they're the two. Okay. They're my favourites. Okay. So thank you, Piers and Luke. I will send you guys codes for free copies of the book. Okay. Awesome. And uh, until next time, I'll see you in the next one. This is Adam Kogan signing off for SSWTV.